the purpose of this mini lecture is to talk about how do you determine the formula for an ion when you're given the name of the ion. So your first question when you look at the ion name is does the name of the ion does it end in ite or eight or is it hydroxide cyanide or ammonium? Um, in these cases if the answer is yes uh, they're all polyatomic ions and in my class you'll go and find your polyatomic ion chart and look up the formula and be very careful some of these names especially with the eights and the ites they the names vary by just one letter and the formulas will vary by just one number in there and you also always have to be careful about writing your subscripts clearly uh, subscripted in your superscripts clearly a little bit above so you can keep those two uh, separate. Now we include hydroxide, cyanide, and ammonium. Um, they almost sound like they could be elements, but if you break them down to the name, you'll find that well, there's, there's no uh, element by that name. If you take hydroxide, um, there's hydrogen and there's oxygen, but there's no hydroxygen anywhere on the periodic table. Uh, there's no cyanine or cyanogen, and there's no element, although a lot of elements in an IUM, like ammonium does, ammonium, well, that just isn't an element on the periodic table. So when you see something, you can't figure out what the root element is, it's probably a polyatomic ion, so you, you look that up on your polyatomic ion chart. Okay, and if it doesn't end in eight or eight, and it's not one of those three, uh, what's the next thing you do? Well, if the answer is no, then the next question you should ask yourself is, does the name end in ide? Because if the answer is yes, then the process is find what the root element is. Um, recall that um, an, an ide ending uh, basically indicates that we have an anion here, and it's the nonmetals that form anions. So you're going to be looking for a root element, one of those nonmetal elements. And then we have to figure out how many electrons would that element have to have added to it so it would have the same number of electrons as a noble gas, because the noble gas electron configurations are very stable, and that's what those, those uh, nonmetal elements non-metallic elements do as they're forming their ions. And so once you figure out how many electrons you have to add, you got to remember the electrons are negative, and so it adds that many negative charges to your particle. Okay. If it doesn't end in ide, next question is, is the element in groups 1a, 2a, or 3a? And if the answer is yes, again, our, the, the name will be the name of a metal, and then we have to figure out how many electrons do we have to subtract from that particular element to get to the, have the same number of electrons as a noble gas. And again, I'm going to go through this process and I'll give you some examples as we go. But when we subtract the electrons, uh, we're taking away the negative charges, so it ends up being a positive ion. The metals make cations, and so that uh, we're determining uh, the positive charge on the, the ion basic, ba based on how many electrons we've taken away. And then the last question, th did I have a Roman numeral? Th this may be something that you'll just get used to. As soon as you see the Roman numeral in the name, you know right away that we have a cation. Um, it's going to, because there are metals, it's going to be a metallic element, it's going to form a positive ion, and so the Roman numeral actually tells you directly what the charge is, the positive charge that's going to be in that ion. So there's one other thing to recall. There are three, there are three ions that won't fit any of that sequence, um, and you just have to memorize these. The silver ion, the zinc ion, and the cadmium ion. They're all transition metals, but one thing that's different about these transition metals and the other transition metals is they always form the same ion. Silver always forms a single plus, whereas some the other transition metals, they can sometimes make one charge, sometimes make another, so we have to give extra information in the name to make sure you know which one it is. Well, if we say the silver ion, there's only one ion that forms we can't really look at the periodic table and figure out that it's going to be a single plus. We just have to memorize that AG is a single plus. And likewise, uh, for zinc and cadmium, they are always two plus ions. So as soon as we say the zinc ion, you have to just memorize it's Zn2 plus. So let's go through some examples here. So we've got our, our process chart here. And our first example is the carbonate ion. So we look at carbonate. Say, does it end in ite or eight? 
and certainly it does. It's, it's carbonate. So we're going to look at our, our polyatomic ion chart. And we look up and say that's a CO3 with a 2 minus charge. Next example is the nitride ion. So now we look say, well, it doesn't end in ITER-8, and uh, it's not hydroxide or cyanide or ammonium, and that looks kind of like uh, an element root there. So we find the element root, and we say, okay, the root of that is nitrogen. So now we need a periodic table. So we're going to take a look at the periodic table, and we find nitrogen on the periodic table. It's over there in uh, number 7. And we say, well, what numerically, what's the nearest noble gas? Because if we can get the same number of electrons as a noble gas, it's a very stable arrangement of electrons. So we look and say, well, the closest uh, noble gas numerically is neon with 10. So we know that as an atom, nitrogen has seven protons and it has seven electrons. Um, in order to get the same number of electrons as neon, we have to go from seven to 10. We have to add three electrons to get the same number of electrons as the nearest noble gas. Well, recall that electrons are negative, and so this is going to add a negative charge. Since there are three electrons, we're going to add three negative charges. So we go back and say, okay, we're going to take our nitrogen and add three negative charges to it, and that's our nitride ion. Next example is the potassium ion. Doesn't end in ITER-8. It's um, not one of those other kind of uh, unusual polyatomic ions up there. It doesn't end in ID. So then our next question is, is it in groups 1A, 2A, or 3A? And it's over on the left-hand side in group 1A. So we we're going to figure out how many electrons do we need to subtract. So we find our element potassium over here, number 19. And even though it looks like they are really, really far away from the noble gases, the periodic table wraps around. And uh, we look over here and say, well, there's argon at 18. Well, it's only one less, one number less than potassium. So that means that potassium, um, even though at an atom it has 19 protons and 19 electrons, to get to 18 electrons, we just had to remove one electron. So we just need to lose one electron. And because we're losing a negative charge, the, remain, the remainder of that ion is going to be positive. Because okay? remember, losing an ion makes it positive. And you always remember that your metals over on the left-hand side of the periodic table, they're always going to form those cations, those positive ions. So this time, we only have to lose one electron. So our potassium ion is just going to pick up a single positive charge. Our final example is the lead Roman numeral 4 ion, or we just read that lead 4 ion. We take a look at it, and we say, well, it's Pb for lead, and the Roman numeral 4 tells us it's going to be a, a 4 plus charge. At this point, here's some practice problems for you to work on. We've got the fluoride ion, the tin 2 ion, the hypochlorite ion, and the calcium ion. And I would recommend pausing the video at this point um, just to give yourself a chance to catch up with these. And in a moment, I, you can restart it and there will be the answers displayed.